Hello everyone, welcome to Critical Faculty. I'm your host, Hani Salim. Today is evolution time, uh, and it's not just a theory, as they say. Um, I would like to um, introduce uh, Erica to the studio. Um, hello, Erica, how are you? Hi, I'm great, how are you? I'm so thrilled to have you. I've um, watched your conversation with a common friend, um, Derek from Myth Vision, and I was so impressed by your energy. Above all, I mean, the knowledge is there, but the amount of energy is what really captured me. You really like what you do. I do. I mean, that's, I feel like that's the goal, right? And I'm, I'm so, I'm so lucky to get to spend as much time as I do talking about a part of our world, a part of the natural world that is just so utterly fascinating. And most people, when they, they, they get a good idea about really and truly how this works, um, evolution as an idea and the various fields of biology that support it and are integrated with it, uh, the more people that I feel tend to, tend to kind of pull onto that enthusiasm and feel feel similarly. So, you know, that's, that's the, I'm hoping it's infectious. Well, I would like you, I mean, I, I'm broadcasting to slightly different audience, a bit in the US, but this is a different world. We, Australia, New Zealand, and a lot um, in the Middle East will be watching us later on. This will be subtitled in Arabic. So I would like you please to introduce yourself. What do you do? What, what, what are your areas of expertise? Um, and uh, while you're speaking, I am going to be displaying your wonderful channel as well for the audience to get acquainted and hopefully subscribe. Oh, lovely. Okay. Well, my name is Erica. I'm, I go by Gutsick Gibbon here on YouTube, mostly because my favorite primate is a gibbon. A uh, gibbon is a type of lesser ape. My education background is, I like to think that it's its a little convoluted, but in a good way. It's, it's given me a nice broad sort of pool of uh, information to pull from. Originally, I was pre-vet, and so my undergraduate degree is in pre-professional animal science. So I took a lot of chemistry and a lot of physics and a lot of biology. Uh, and it was during my undergraduate career that I had the pleasure of going on a study abroad trip to Tanzania, where I got to you know walk around Gombe National Park and see the chimpanzees, as well as a lot of different um, sort of ecosystems across the country. And I started kind of just in the back of my mind thinking, man, this, this would be something really cool to, to get to focus on, you know, the, the tree of life and how it is interconnected. Uh, but I was still on the pre-vet path. So I, I graduated um, for my undergraduate degree and I decided to take that summer and into the next year because I, I had a spare semester on my hands to work at a veterinary clinic. So I, I worked at a clinic for a while, got some clinical experience working in um, sort of companion animal veterinary science. Uh, and it kind of bummed me out because I love animals and it was kind of sad to see them sick all the time. And uh, it was then that I got a, a notification on my computer um, so through a couple of boards that I followed that there was a master's opportunity, a master's of research program in London at the University of Roehampton for uh, primatology. So the study of primates, the, the order of animals that comprises what people tend to think of as lemurs, monkeys, and apes. And I was like, well, I think those guys are awesome. Like, that was one of my favorite parts. I ended up picking up a minor in my undergraduate um, sort of career in anthropology and in biology. So I was like, maybe I, maybe I do this. Maybe I, I moved to London for a year and I, I get my master's and I figured out. And so I did that. And while I was over there, I, I fell in love with it, um, with research in general and with primatology, specifically this, this branch of, of organisms that I think most people can at least say share a, a superficial similarity to humans. And so I thought, OK, well, maybe maybe I get the PhD. So I applied for my PhD after I graduated with my master's of research in primate biology, behavior and conservation. And I started my PhD program um, a year ago this past fall. Um, at my current university in biological anthropology. So biological anthropology is a field. It's really interesting because it's it's nestled in anthropology in the United States, but it's sort of a separate STEM thing in Europe, which tends to be associated with like the Max Planck Institute. 
Um, and interestingly enough, we we got a Nobel Prize with, from Swante Pavo, the, the father of sort of paleogenomics just this past year. So more and more people are, are appreciating paleoanthropology uh, and biological anthropology as a whole as not just this, this interesting field in and of itself, but a field that can tell us more about ourselves in very important ways, such as our history and our health. And so biological anthropology, to, to be kind of clear, is this, is this merging of biology, paleontology, and human history. So it's this idea of where do humans come from? Where does our biological form come from, at least? And so it tends to merge these fields of uh, taphonomy, geology, general biology, anatomy, biomechanics, ecology, and primatology, in order to get a big picture idea of if evolution, the big concept, is legitimate, can we figure out where humans fit in? And, and how do those kinds of uh, ideas mesh with what we know about the natural world? And so I think it's cool. I, I, I love my field. It, it was only uh, yesterday, actually, that we, we got another interesting breakthrough from South Africa, where uh, Lee Berger, a paleoanthropologist, is reporting that Homo naledi, a hominin that is related to humans, pretty closely related to humans, uh, was utilizing hearths and fire, which is, maybe we'll talk about but so that's my background. That's, that's where I'm coming from. And I think science communication is just an absolutely critical um, endeavor for anybody who, who finds science fascinating because I have the utmost pleasure and luck and, and blessing to be in academia, where a lot of the information is unfortunately kind of out of reach for the general public. And I'm, I'm very lucky to have access to it. So my goal is to take what I learn put it into a digestible format and disseminate it to people who might be interested, right? Because learning shouldn't be out of reach for anybody. And whether you accept evolution or you find issues with it, you should at the very least know what people are saying. This is fantastic. I mean, it is, I'm, I'm so excited about this, today's conversation. But I'm going to, to start with going a little bit back in, in history. And it seems to be that humans... Have, from the very beginning, I try to, to understand and explain things around them. Uh, uh, one of the uh, mysteries a um, few centuries ago uh, was the biological diversity. Immanuel Kant, and I think he was quite wrong about it, he said, there'll never be an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass. And boy, was he wrong. Um, uh, because we have had that Isaac Newton, uh, uh, namely Darwin. But I want you to start by saying, was evolution, because people thought, uh, I was still thinking incorrectly, that Darwin came up with evolution, but I tend to believe that the concept of evolution was a bit older than that, and he barely came with the mechanics of it. Yes, since, since the dawn of time, humans have been capable of looking at the world around us and saying, oh my goodness, the, the menagerie of life, the diversity of life, and people have been capable of looking at different organisms and, and sort of whether it's their heads or on the wall of the cave or in the early principias of, of sort of the Renaissance or far before that in, you know, the, the halls of Greek philosophers, they were capable of looking at the world and saying, there is a lot of different kinds of life out there. And that is just thrilling to, to us because we are, of course, living things. And so the question has always been for people, where is it that humans fit in into this great chain of being as it was sort of originally coined uh, very early on uh, in, in Greek and sort of in Greece, excuse me, and sort of run by, by Greek and Roman philosophers, this idea of scala mature, scala natura, excuse me. And uh, as someone just mentioned in the comments, yes, they're in, in sort of the Middle Eastern areas of thought as well. People were looking at the world around them and especially in sort of the Renaissance there with this enlightenment of mathematics that, that we tend to give as the Middle East credit for, which they wholeheartedly deserve, they were aware of this too. Uh, so people tend to look at, at the world and, and say there, there is indeed a great variety of life. Darwin simply put sort of a name to it and a mechanism to it. And it was very, the, the response to Darwin's work was very famous because when people read what he put to paper, everyone kind of went, duh. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? <laughs> like people tend to think that Darwin, ooh, people were outraged by what he said. Not so. Uh, that came quite a bit later. What, what really happened is people said, what, what an elegant way of putting it. That That's precisely right. <laughs> Organisms yeah. are diverse. And this is because of 
sort of the differential reproductive success that goes on in different organisms, depending but on Erica, the is it is it possible that he was not faced with that with that initial outrage? And I do agree with you. People think he that uh, Thomas Huxley situation where he became his bulldog uh, mm. uh, came, but he kind of he avoided. First of all, he avoided to publish for fifteen or sixteen years yes. until. Wallace has started to co have correspondence with him and say, oh, oh, I've got to publish before. <laughs> get on it. Says, <laughs> yeah. And uh, he avoided also um, including humans um, in, in his first yes. writing. This is true. Yes. Um, in the original sort of on the origin of species, you know, Darwin, as you mentioned, he, he sat on this idea for you know, a decade and a half, give or take. And uh, in part, this was because he was like, okay, this, this seems it's too easy, right? <laughs> like this feels like a good solution, but but should I really put it out there? And as you mentioned, Alfred Wallace, who had done his research out sort of in um, Oceania and Malaysia, specifically was in Indonesia, was the area that he was working, and they sort of independently came to this similar conclusion simply by spending time out in nature. Um, so so yes, the, the two of them kind of came together and through correspondence, they were like, all right. Let's publish this thing. Uh, and when they did, it, it was considered by many to be an instant triumph. There was very little pushback because, again, it, it was a very elegant and critically a simple solution to the answer of the biodiversity of life. The only thing that, that Darwin and Wallace missed was the mechanism of inheritance. Genetics would come later. So first they were you know, talking about how it is uh, that, that traits are selected for. What makes an organism fit in its environment enough to pass on its genes more than anybody else in its population, right? The differential reproductive success, which simply means that one individual may have a better shot at passing their genes on than another individual due to a wide variety of reasons. Um, that was as simple as, this is as simple as it gets, that's natural selection based off of differential reproductive success. Yeah. So, so it, st it started with, 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 with a bit of um, witnessing what's been going on. The, the the beagle trip and the uh, the Galapagos yeah. Islands where he noticed the finches and their peaks and and how they sort of vary according to the food in each of the islands, um, uh, uh, and maybe a bit of um, embryology where you know the fetuses look very very similar uh, from the very beginning, uh, but the hidden variable how does actually that mechanism gets transferred that was. Even though Mendel, Gregor Mendel, was around his era, but there was no direct correspondence. Yeah, Gregor Mendel's story is very tragic because you know he's this Augustinian monk, and he was he had a lot of spare time on his hands, so he spent a lot of this time. For those of you who may be listening and don't know, while well, Alfred, you know Wallace and and Charles Darwin were our sort of fathers of evolution, this idea of what traits get passed on and why, and how does that how is that responsible for the biodiversity on the planet? Gregor Mendel was the guy who was responsible for that mechanism. How is it that these traits pass on mechanically speaking? And the way that he sussed this out was, again, he had a lot of time on his hands, so he bred peas, he bred pea plants. And he very simply cataloged how these pea plants passed on their traits when you cross them in different ways, tall versus short, wrinkly versus smooth. <laughs> and, and he wrote all of this down and, and he published on it. And it got no attention. It got absolutely zero <laughs> attention in his day. He was completely ignored. And so, you know, Mendel went on and he became, um, he got a higher up position at his monastery and then he died of nephritis. And that's so sad. <laughs> and then a couple of years later in the early 1900s, you get a bunch of guys who are, who are you know, kind of sending this, this idea of inheritance. So how does it work? And they stumbled across Mendel's work and they all were like, oh boy, this is it. This is it. We got to give this guy credit, right? And you know, to their credit, they they didn't leave them all behind. They put his work to the forefront and sort of worked around it. But genetics would become the basis for sort of the second half of the understanding of what evolution is with the modern synthesis in sort of the 19th century, 20th century, excuse me, sure. um, where we talk more about actual mechanisms for for inheritance, phylogeny. Um, and, and sort of the, this, this idea of the, how genes interact with one another to, to make you you, which is cool. And technology is, is an absolute blessing with that as well, um, especially as it's become more affordable. We've been able to, to run uh, significantly more tests on organisms all over the world instead of just, you know, high priority draft 
graft genomes of specific critters. Yeah, it's very interesting you say that because both sort of theories sort of stayed dormant for quite a bit, even evolution between the 1870 uh, all the way maybe to 1910, 1920, kind of uh, people didn't care much about it and stayed dormant and then it got resurrected suddenly because things sort of started to make sense by combining uh, disciplines of science together, namely biology and um, uh, embryology and a bit of ge genetics. And voila, we've got yeah. the emergence of neo-Darwinism. Yep, and this, this idea of uh, sort of development recapitulating evolution came along with sort of the early half of the 20th century. And lo and behold, it does. A, a classic example in humans is when we are sort of in our development, we develop two mammary ridges, as all mammals do. And in most mammals, these mammary ridges, very early on in development, become uh, the nipples, which allow for lactation in adult mammals. And they develop in males and females because they start development prior to the differentiation of the sex of the organism. So that's there you go. That's why that's why men have nipples. Um, but in humans, there is a and actually, for those of you who may not know, in catarine primates, uh, sorry, haplorine primates as well. So tarsiers are included in this. Um, there is a triggering in that development that negates the development of all of the sort of nipples in the mammary ridges, except for a single pair, two nipples. Um, and that is why the our sort of group, our haplorines, only have a single pair. And coincidentally, or perhaps not so coincidentally, we also only tend to have one or two kids. So we don't need that many to feed that many kids because we don't have that many. <laughs> two will suffice. Uh, but people bring up other examples for, for development. We talk about the uh, pharyngeal gill slits, the, the ridges that eventually become critical portions of the jaw um, mm -hmm. that some people tend to be born with sort of the remnants of, they're not real gills, but they're remnants of that development. The, the post-anal tail is a classic example too. We start to develop our tail. Um, and like the rest of the, of the apes, the hominids, humans do have a very small post-anal tail. It's, that's your tailbone, your coccyx. Uh, and it's just as small as a chimpanzee's because we, ju we just don't, we don't develop it. Um, there are other primates that have sort of reduced that area. But it, the, the whole point is simply that your development in some level, on some level, recapitulates evolution. Um, and people tend to point to the... Uh, cetaceans, dolphins, and whales, they develop hind limb buds during the first few weeks of their development, and they grow just like their front limbs, right? So, they, you know, dolphins have their front flippers, and then they have a tail fluke in the back. They don't have a pair of back flippers. But they start to develop early on in this organism sort of life sequence uh, when it's in utero, and then something triggers genomically, and it cancels the process, and the limb buds in the back are reabsorbed. And every so often, a dolphin will continue to develop it. And we do have cetaceans that actually have two sets of flippers, a front set and a back set. They're rare, but they exist. And this is, of course, another example of this, this evolutionary history of this organism. So there are an infinite amount of cool examples that we could sit down and talk about, about how your life history emerges very early indeed. It, it emerges in your mother's womb. The, the conversation about evolution is quite interesting in the Middle East because uh, you, you have two different groups. Uh, those who would uh, completely outright deny uh, evolution, saying that there's no such thing, uh, and then end up conflating a biogenesis with evolution. They explain the first cell, explain Luca, thinking actually it is, a lot of people think it's actually a single cell that started the whole thing. Uh, so you might, uh, even though it's in sort of the biogenesis, but I think there are some indication that a um, uh, uh, minimum uh, founding population concept dictates that, that you can't start species by just a, a pair, Adam or Eve, or two pairs, or what, whatever. Well, the, the interesting thing about speciation, right? So, so let's let's back up. Let's talk about what evolution is and what it requires. Put super simply, all evolution is is it is a change in allelic frequency in a population over time. So technically, any kind of microevolution that people tend to talk about, that, that's evolution, right? Um, in the United States, we have a population of salamanders that live over on the sort of west coast of California. And they're in the midst of speciation because adjacent populations are called a ring species because there's about 12 populations of them in a big ring located around sort of the southern portion of the state. And adjacent salamander populations can interbreed 
but more than one removed, so let's say there's a population in between one and a third, they can no longer actually exchange genes. So they're actually in the middle of reproductive isolation, which if you're going by the biological species concept is going to be what you consider you're done with speciation. Right? But the point is, is that if organisms are changing in response to the environment around them, whether it's longer furred foxes being selected because it's gradually getting colder or perhaps the better thermoregulation seen in the population of desert dwelling mice this is all evolution is and that's what darwin noticed if you can better thermoregulate that's the word that we use to talk about uh getting rid of heat so humans thermoregulate by sweating but other animals do it in different ways so if you can thermoregulate better and you live in a desert environment you're going to have more kids, you're going to grow to be older, which means you also increase your fecundity and the number of kids that you can have, you pass those genes that made you successful onto your offspring. It's as simple as that, right? That's, that's all it is. It's the differential reproductive success. So those mice are going to do better than ones who don't perhaps thermoregulate as well. Um, and so this idea of, of speciation and, you know, how organisms change over time isn't nearly as, as complicated as sort of people tend to have it advertised to them. And certainly evolution as an idea is wholly separated from abiogenesis, right? Abiogenesis is the process of how do you get life from sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? It's it's not yeah. organized chemicals, but it's, it's inorganic chemical processes that tend to result in organization. So how do you go from chemical reactions to something that is alive? Once you have a population of organisms, then evolution can occur. But single individuals don't evolve. So when you think about this idea of an original pair, two individuals can perhaps have a beneficial mutation and pass that on, and it can influence the evolution of a species. But there is no thing A turns into thing B, right? If you had the entire history, the entire fossil record of how dogs descend from wolves, no one in the world would be able to point at the organism at which dogs begin and wolves end. It's like picking out where color starts on a color gradient, right? So we tend to hear, at least here uh, in the United States, well, you're never going to have a cow produce something that isn't a cow, or you're not going to have a dog produce something that isn't a dog. And to that I say, no, you, you don't, right? Uh, things don't outgrow their ancestry. So we evolved from a mammal, and we're still mammals. A dog evolved from a previous mammal, it's still a mammal, right? Um, and so on and so forth. This is referred to as the law of monophyly. So you are what your ancestors were, which is where the word speciation comes from because things further specify. They become more, they gain these more specific categories as life goes on. And I have opinions about how sort of real species truly are in a biological sense or whether or not they're just useful tools that humans use to categorize the life around us. But what there is no denying is that populations of organisms change. We've seen this in our own lifetimes. We've seen this since humans have observed animals, right? We see the, the shortening of wingspans of different birds that dwell in cities because it's easier for them to fly without clipping their wings on a, on a car in traffic. It's as simple as that. Um, it's organisms with beneficial characteristics, pass them on. And critically, every step of that sort of evolution, which is what it is, has to be beneficial. Which brings us to the difference between microevolution, which pretty much everybody accepts, and macroevolution, right? And the difference between them in a technical sense is just speciation. If something speciates, that's macroevolution in a conventional sense, full stop. But when people think of macroevolution, they sort of tend to have something different in mind. They, they think of the cow producing a non-cow. Um, and really these large scale changes that they envision, even though it's still abiding by the, the law of monophyly and it seems very difficult. All this is, is sort of consecutive small steps, each and of the, each in and of themselves, excuse me, being beneficial until eventually you result in something that does indeed look quite different from its ancestor. No one here could tell me that a pug looks like a wolf, right? These, these two things look very different. And yet we certainly agree um, based on their genetics that one does descend from the population of the other. It's just dependent on how these traits are selected. And when they're selected by people, that change happens fast. When they're selected by nature, it still happens, but quite a bit slower. Fair enough. One of the things and the misconception about uh, speciation 
um, um, is that you, you quite rightly pointed out that people are expecting things to turn into something else quite immediately, even like with the uh, uh, London underground mosquito situation. So, well, it's still a mosquito. It, it hasn't emerged to be a cow. Uh, they don't realize that uh, we're talking about probably a process of a couple of million years, maybe five. Uh, and once we having that uh, geographical drift and isolation, um, uh, the uh, I believe the um, you, you start with uh, not the, the ability of having offspring sort of stop, or you might have an an, an, um, an offspring that uh, does not produce uh, viable offsprings, like they, they can't longer produce, like a mule uh, and things like that. But what and I'm trying to understand it here as well with you, is once that drift happens, it sets the new species on a path that's under different environmental pressures, different food sources, which means their path to evolution change, and therefore eventually the shape of the animal and the look of the animal will eventually match the environment they newly live in. Would that be an approximation? Well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we see this, they, they call it, sort of Ber I believe it's Bergman and Allen's rule. These, these rules of how organisms are generally shaped based off of the temperature of their environment. Animals that live in cold climates tend to have shorter limbs and bigger bodies, and animals that live in warm climates tend to be lankier. And this makes sense because you want to conserve heat if you live in the cold, and if you live in the warm, you want to rid of it. You want to thermoregulate. And we see this even in people, right? Like if you look at the general body proportions of someone who lives in perhaps um, Uganda or Ethiopia, they're, they're tall, they're lanky. You look at somebody who lives in perhaps Norway, they tend to be quite a bit stockier. It simply makes sense. Um, and it's all evolution really is in the sense that people tend to think of it is it's just the accumulation of these changes in response to the environment. And I think what people have a hard time thinking of, right, what they have a hard time conceptualizing, it's one thing to sit here and say that. It's another thing to show support for these large scale changes that happen over the course of millions of years that it is impossible for humans to observe. And to that, I like to say, that's where the predictions come in, right? Making a prediction on the basis of evolutionary theory, then going out and searching the fossil record and looking in these particular locations that perhaps you predicted, and seeing if you can find the critter that, that would be proposed to live there in that time period, say you're looking at um, the, the divergent two organisms, and you know based on the molecular clock when they probably diverged, and you know based off of the current fossil record where they were probably living right before and right after they diverged, so you can get a decent idea of, of where to search for the common ancestor of these things. Um, and so evolution sets up this evolutionary theory, as it were, sets up a decent prediction as to how you can or cannot add support to it, um, sort of in a in a deep time sense. Because I, I don't think anybody who would be listening to this has a problem with microevolution, as I've been saying, you know, these, these sort of organisms evolving in the lab, the Lenski classic experiment, the birds that evolve shorter wings, or the salamanders out in California. The question is, can we show support for large scale evolution through geologic time. And to do that, you have to do two things. One, you have to make an accurate prediction or several accurate predictions, uh, ideally, like I just mentioned. And two, you have to show that the time is there. And I would propose that one, we know the earth is very ancient. This is, this is not up for debate. Um, and I think the easiest way to show support for this is to talk about radiometric dating. Um, radiometric dating works. That's how we look at the ratio of parent to daughter isotopes in a given sample. And using that ratio and a known half-life, which are not violated in meaningful ways in nature at the time, we can get an idea about how old the sample is. And the oldest rocks on the planet Earth are 4.5 billion years. So we know that the Earth is, is pretty old. And the way that I tend to propose that is a massive support for this is the fact that we use radiometric dating in fossil fuel discovery. So if you want to find oil and gas and coal, you use radiometric dating to characterize an area in a process called basin modeling. And if it seems like it's going to be rich for oil, that's when you drive. So every time you fill up your car or, you know, you, you get on a bus or a train, you're validating radiometric dating because we are having no issues finding natural gases and fossil fuels and things like that. So the second part of that is, does evolution make accurate predictions? And the go-to example that everyone tends to bring up that I'm going to bring up to you here is the discovery of Tiktaalik. 
So I'm sure you've heard of Tiktaalik. Um, Tiktaalik yes. is this very interesting tetrapod. It's sort of dubbed a fishapod because the front half of the thing looks like an amphibian and the back half of this thing looks like a fish. So it's proposed as the sort of common ancestor of all land dwelling tetrapods. The first critter that curled up onto land and gave rise to all of our, our tetrapods on land today. And so before Tiktaalik was discovered, we had for sure tetrapods living in sort of the late Devonian and Carboniferous, and we had for sure lobe-finned fish that lived earlier than that in um, sort of the, the Orvician, uh, Silurian, excuse me, um, and into the, the sort of early Devonian. And so Neil Shubin, a paleontologist at the time, he looked at the molecular clock of a lot of these animals and he thought to himself, okay, well, if we wind back the, the tectonic plates, where is going to be our best guess for sort of coastal, tropical areas that would be perfect for a, a budding animal, a budding tetrapod to move onto land? He sussed out that this would be what is modern day Greenland, which at the time was perfectly equatorial and a great beachfront property. So he took his, his guys out there and they went and they combed Greenland for fossils, and it was on you know one of the last weeks that they were out there that they found Tiktaalik, a perfect transitional species. This thing, again, the front half of it looks like an amphibian. It's got a long, wide head with eyes on the top, not to the side like modern fish. It has sort of digits that are encompassed in its fins. It has strong humerus and uh, radius and ulna that allows for it to push up. It has strong pectoral muscles for pushing up out of the mud. It's got a tail and hind flippers, and perhaps most critically, it has lungs and it has gills, right? This thing is about as perfect of a transitional species as you can <laughs> And it was found after a paleontologist made a prediction on the basis of an ancient earth and how evolution would have occurred within the tetrapods, right? So that's the gold standard of science we tend to hear is making accurate predictions. And so I think this is a wonderful example of that shouldn't happen if organisms don't share a common ancestor. Um, and to be very clear that that idea of common ancestry from Darwin just came from winding the clock back. He looked at modern day processes, that differential reproductive success that we talked about earlier. And he said, what if this has been happening for a long time? And this was predicated on the ideas of Charles Lyell, a budding geologist whose book, Critical mm -hmm. Geology, he had on hand. And he said, okay, well, if geology says the earth is very old, then the processes I'm observing today have been happening for a very long time indeed, which means if you wind the clock back, diversity should decrease, eventually honing in on a universal common ancestor. And, and that's all it took. Right. And sure enough, as we see when we look at the fossil record, organisms start becoming more complex over time, not less. Mm. They don't start infinitely complex. They begin these weird, spongy, fleshy fronds and mats in the Ediacaran, and gradually they develop these myriad of different mouth parts and eyes and armor and fins. And then they explode in diversity at the end of the Devonian move up onto land, we get all sorts of different strange critters living in the Permian, the synapsids and the sauropsids. Eventually we get the dinosaurs after the mammals are sort of snuffed out at the beginning, nearly snuffed out at the beginning with the Permian mass extinction. The dinosaurs reign to the end of the Mesozoic. And once they're, you know, thrown off course by an asteroid impact, the mammals take the stage. And and this is, this is- So it's, it's almost like the big bang of biology. You, you, you run the, the tape backwards and uh, the, the beginning is, is a bit more um, sort of uh, not as complex. Uh, it's, it's kind of entropy as well uh, when, you, when you think about it, that versification. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I want to start sort of pointing out some issues in, in the current um, uh, perception of, the, of any person, especially those uh, who live in the Middle East, about um, evolution. A uh, couple of things. I mean, we talked about speciation. Uh, we've kind of cl clarified that. Uh, but, um, I mean, we're going to go a little bit basic here, but it's just a theory. Um, yeah. If it was a fact, it would be called a fact. Yes. Uh, it's called a theory, which means, you know, people think it might be something, but it's not really proved. Yeah, I mean, I so it's interesting because I, I teach at my university um, a lab, the Introduction to Biological Anthropology. And so to start this, we cover, um, you know, it's interesting. Anthropology, anthropology, excuse me, and the um, the idea of what science is. What is science? And all science is, is is a way of knowing. And because it's a way of knowing, we categorize different levels of knowledge. 
right? And so what people tend to misunderstand, and this happens in the West as well, is they take the colloquial or everyday use of a theory and they equate it to the scientific version of a theory. So I might walk downstairs, I, I have, you know, pets in my house, dogs and cats, and I might look at my counter and I might see that the bread has been nibbled and say, I have a theory that my cat did that. I have a theory that he jumped up onto the counter and began nibbling the bread because I didn't nibble the bread and my husband didn't nibble the bread and the dogs can't get on the counter. So it simply must be the cat. Uh, and I would say that that's a theory. In science, however, that translates one to one as a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an idea that is generated off of observation. I observe the bread has been nibbled and I observe that my cat is acting guilty. And so I come to the conclusion that the cat probably nibbled the bread. Uh, but in science, I wouldn't stop there, right? I would proceed to experiment. I put a second loaf of bread on the counter and I stick a camera up to see if my cat commits the crime a second time, right? And then perhaps I can come to a conclusion that my observation was correct. And then I can develop my theory of cat nibbling the bread on the counter, right? Because in science, a theory is just a set of supported hypotheses in a sort of um, a, a with a through line that explains a an observation or a set of observations, right? As a result, if you really want to come down to brass tacks, evolutionary theory is a theory. So is germ theory. So is the theory of, of you know, atomic theory, the theory of, of, of sort of, you know, uh, isotopes and how they decay and interact with one another. So is the theory of gravity, right? A, a lot of these things that we tend to think of as laws are actually theories. And in fact, what is an often a misconception in my classes is students tend to think if a theory gets good enough, it becomes a law and laws are facts. But that's not how it works. Laws are based on mathematics, right? So if, if it's a law, it's explaining what happens, right? The law of conservation of energy. It's explaining how energy interacts and, and you know, when in a given equation, whatever. And that's just an observation that's explained by a mathematical equation. Theories tend to explain why something is happening or offer an idea of why something is happening. So hypothesis is really the one-to-one -one for how we use theory in everyday language. But in science, a theory is, it has to be rigorously supported by decades of, of experimental results. Um, and to, to folks who, who don't believe me, I, I simply say, well, look at other theories. Do you accept them? I bet you do, right? Um, I certainly do. Very, very interesting. And, and, and it's still lacking in probably in, in the entire world, obviously, to different degrees, um, even in, in the US and in Australia, they'll still use the colloquial understanding of the word theory, um, um, pretty much uh, thinking that, that that's not a fact then. And now let's talk about one of the things that some of the philosophers brought to science, um, uh, Popper and Kuhn and the likes of which have added a lot to science, uh, including a very, very handy concept of falsification. Yes. Falsifiability. Uh, uh, a lot of people would say, oh, well, uh, evolution is a really, you can't witness this. And uh, it's unfalsifiable. Uh, it's it's one of those things that's sort of up in the air. But uh, I probably you and I tend to disagree. I think it's one of the most falsifiable theories out there. Absolutely. Give us some examples. <laughs> Evolution would be, oh my gosh, it's so easy to falsify. All, all you would have to do is find a, a series of out-of-place fossils. Show me the, the fossil of a rabbit in the Cambrian 550 million years ago, and you're done, right? That negates this idea of common descent. Or you could show some kind of alternative hypothesis that can show how life becomes more diverse through time that is better than mutation and natural selection. Um, in, this, in the United States, we have some people who are trying to propose this. They're young earth creationists, but they're trying to propose something very interesting indeed. Um, but it's it's easily falsifiable. You just have to poke a hole in the idea. Falsification is, is the most beautiful part about science, right? Because if you can throw absolutely everything in an idea to show that it's wrong and it still stands, you got yourself a really good working theory. Uh, and people have been trying to prove evolution wrong since Darwin because there's a lot of money in overturning a big idea. Look at the difference between or the public reaction and the scientific community's reaction to relativity, where we had this idea of Newtonian physics. It goes so far. And, and once you get into big astronomical 
uh, objects in space, it, it, it breaks down. Why is that? And Einstein comes along and he says, we have relativity, right? We have to explain these large objects in the context of space time and its interaction with mass and gravity and all this other stuff that is so over my head. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and, and we didn't throw out Newtonian physics because of relativity, to be sure. But what it did was it falsified Newtonian you know, physics' ability to, to, cap, to cope with these sort of astronomical objects by not only showing that it can't, but that something else can, right? Falsification is, is great in and of itself, but even if an aspect of evolution could be falsified, which I would, I would propose that none of it really has, you would also have to have an alternative way to explain the data. And, yes. um, you know, genetics has been very difficult for folks who, who want to debunk evolution because what genetics has showed us with the modern synthesis and beyond is that not only do all organisms on the planet, as far as we can tell, share the same genetic code of, of DNA and RNA, but that code in its, in its sort of full form in its given genome, which is a genome is simply the sum of the genetic code of a given organism. And it's different based off of the individual, but they're they're sort of calling cards for a given species, right? We sequenced the human genome in 2002, the chimpanzee genome in 2005, and we sequenced a lot of other genomes since then. These genomes form nested hierarchies, and they shouldn't if life doesn't share a common ancestor. In fact, not only do they share, not only do they form nested hierarchies with chimpanzees and humans being more closely related than either is to a gorilla, and gorillas, chimps, and humans being more closely related to all of one another than either is to a macaque monkey, and that group being more closely related than any of them is to a rat, and so on and so forth, all the way up until we've got this our, our entire catalog of genomes fitting into sort of this this big phylogeny, right? That works in the functional regions, and they also nest in the non-functional regions, and and this is what I tend to bring up to to, to folks who talk about um, intelligent design. What I'm not saying by any means is that there isn't someone who kicks off evolution and sort of keeps it on the right track. I, I have no way of proving that that is mm -hmm. correct. What I am saying, however, is that the way that they, if, if there is sort of a higher power have done this, the, the way that they've done this is analogous with evolution from a common ancestor. What we're seeing is a common design and similarities based off of function. We're seeing nested hierarchies within functional regions of the genome. So the bits of your genome that do important stuff. And we also see these exact same nested hierarchies in the DNA that does nothing. And this should not be the case if we all if we all don't descend from a common ancestor. Um, so right. if, you could show, if you could show either that the entire genome is functional which we know that it's not because we've done knockout tests on things like mice uh, where you kick out genes and they can still reproduce and make their own offspring. And then those offspring can reproduce. So these, these genes aren't doing anything as far as we can tell. Or you would need to show that there's some fundamental linchpin incorrect in how we're, we're sort of creating these genomes in the first place, or right? like sequencing these genomes in the first place. As far as I know, neither of those have happened. So it's going to be very difficult to, dis to uh, falsify the interrelatedness, and interrelatedness, excuse me, of all of life on the basis of constrained or functional and unconstrained non-functional sequences. So that's why intelligent design is never going to be a viable competing theory. It's actually a pseudoscience because it does not give an alternative. All what it says, uh, obviously, you're probably aware of the Discovery Institute, the Michael B, the Meyer, uh, oh, yeah. the Lenski. They utilize and code a lot. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, yeah, James Tour, um, you know, in, oh, the, yeah. in, in chemistry as well, is trying, oh, and, yeah. and it's all to do with the couple of misconcepts. Uh, well, let's start with irreducible complexity, uh, created by Michael Behe and the mousetrap analogy and the flagellum, uh, uh, where uh, he's been told that what you're telling us that has it's uh, irreducibly complex. It is irreducible. It, it is reducible. It has started from simpler uh, forms. Why are you stopping at that saying this complex form cannot just emerge out of nothing? We, we are telling you it has evolved from, from previous simpler forms. Behe has been, all of these guys, Behe, Meyer, Tour, they've all been incapable of presenting something that is truly irreducibly complex. So irreducible complexity is this idea that you have a, a functional 
sort of organ or organ system. He, tend, B, he tends to bring up the bacterial flagellum. Uh, mm -hmm. It is the structure that requires all of its parts to work. And so their argument is the, the statistics of all of these important necessary parts evolving at the exact same time to, to create this functional unit are astronomically low. Therefore, it's irreducibly complex. You cannot reduce it to its more baser parts. Right? And to that, I say, Behe, Meyer, and Tour have been shown over and over and over again that there are precursors to every single step of the structures that they've proposed are irreducibly complex. They've been proven wrong with, with the uh, bacterial flagellum. They've been proven wrong with the blood clotting cascade. They've been proven wrong with the immune system. Each one of these systems can, in fact, be reduced to an earlier version that, and this is the critical part here, that is in and of itself useful and increases the fitness of the organism. This is the basic concept, right? What's the use in half a wing? What's the use in half an immune system? How can an organism wait around for the full uh, sort of suite of characteristics necessary for the, the use, as it were, of the final product that we're viewing today? How do we get to that step, right? How do we get that final product? The answer is every individual subsequent step has to increase the fitness of the organism in and of itself. And we found that for every single example, in, in, in Behe's example with the flagellum, right? The uh, little twirly tail that is on the edge of a bacteria that allows the bacteria to you know, propel itself through a given substrate, a given uh, you know, solution. And it turns out that this thing has evolved from um, a, an apparatus that delivered what is effectively venom in, in a precursor bacteria, right? Um, the motor, the, the tail itself, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And I'm more familiar with macroscopic organisms. So the bacteria and stuff, so it tends to go over my, it's been a long time since I've taken microbiology. But in birds, the evolution of feathers is another perfect example. Why, why did feathers evolve? Well, a little bit of feather is not gonna let you fly, but you know what it is gonna do? It's gonna keep you warm, right? Mm -hmm. And a little bit more from that step lets you glide, right? And the very first dinosaurs that we see that have feathers, it's just a downy covering then the bones get lighter, the feathers become larger, and the coverage increases. And we suspect, based off of the biomechanics studies of these sort of early therap or not therap excuse me, theropods that are capable of gliding, right, that this is just too coincidental to fit into time, yeah. right? We've got, we've got the down, the gliding feathers, and then fully fledged flight. And we find this, of course, in subsequent order in dating in the fossil record. Um, and, and I bring up, you know, I, my, my focus is primates and human evolution. So there is an infinite amount of examples that we could talk about there. The evolution of bipedalism, the evolution of big brains, the, the reduction of the dentition, the dexterous hands, right? We, there, there are an infinite number of examples in, in primates where each individual step is in and of itself beneficial. So here's a perfect example, a perfect mechanism, a perfect um, strategy for the ID proponents, intelligent design proponents and creationists alike to prove evolution wrong. Present your irreducibly complex structure, right? Present you know, Erica, your possible evolution. I, I don't understand this. I don't understand why people don't get it. Like we do it ourselves. We, we, when, we, when we invented the wheel, uh, the Lamborghinis weren't first found. There were, were, were chariots, there were right. cars, there were bicycles, and then eventually, and people don't understand, uh, these things had interim usages. So the evolution of the eye, all what you needed is a pinhole to, to, to distinguish between dark and light. And that was enough. That was good enough at the time. You don't even need a pinhole, a patch of cells that can distinguish mm -hmm. between dark and light without directionality. It doesn't even need to have formed a cup. A simple patch of cells and our skin cells are photosensitive, right? I, I mean, photosensitivity is not very difficult in a cell, in an epithelial cell. It's it's like a couple of, of you know, um, uh, nucleotide substitutions, something along those lines. It's not very complex, right? A photosensitive cell allows an organism to, as you said, distinguish between light and dark. And if you're a flatworm living on the bottom of the ocean in the Lake Cambrian and big mean anomalocaris, this big predator animal is coming above you, it swims above you and it casts a shadow and you say, I got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. Instant fitness benefit, right? The next step is you take that photosensitive patch of cells and you turn it into a cup. Once it's a cup, not only can you tell light versus dark, but you can tell directionality. You can say, ah, the light versus dark is coming from that direction. I must swim that way, right? And that automatically gives you a fitness benefit for everybody with the regular patch of cells. 
once you close it off into a pinhole shape, you can start focusing that light and, and utilizing in, in later organisms certain aspects of our, our what would become the visual cortex to create actual images that can be processed by this budding brain. And the pinhole lens camera is, um, the camera lens is, is typically called, is mostly utilized by mollusks. The human design of the cornea, the way we've set our Korean retina up is so bad. Like it's, it's backwards. The light shines on the back of the eye, it processes forwards, and then it has to meet to the optic nerve and go out of a blind spot in the back of the eye. And you might say, well, maybe there's a design purpose for that. Then why do mollusks have it the right way? Why, why did they get why did they get the good version? They don't have a blind spot, right? Um, so this is this is fascinating stuff. And again, I want to make it very clear: this doesn't mean that there isn't a head honcho who kicks evolution off or keeps it guided in the right direction. In fact, I, I used to be um, a theistic evolutionist in, in my own faith, where I was very interested in sort of the usage of the, the guided hand of evolution. And I thought that how, how incredible that some people wouldn't accept evolution who, who were religious, because I can't think of a more perfect way for a creator deity to make sure that life stays alive and adapting. It's a perfect system right? It's no different than chemistry or physics, right? It's, it's just a system that maintains the integrity of life and the diversity of it. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and I love that about it. And even though I'm, I'm an agnostic these days, I still look at it and I say, wow, what, what a beautifully elegant and also at the same time jury rigged system. <laughs> We've got Derek in the house. Hello, Derek. Um, Thank you so much, my friend. Um, and they hey, say hello to you. <laughs> um, uh, great guest, Erica. Why does evolution work better with naturalism than philosophies in your estimation? He loves your work. Yeah. yeah, so honestly, this is this is going to sound a bit cliche, but, but the reason why I think evolution can work better with naturalism than with um, other belief systems that tend to have a religious angle to it is because there are patients in the natural world, ladies and gentlemen, um, what really tripped Darwin up was parasitic wasps. He saw this, this intricately evolved and developed system where wasps can isolate a specific caterpillars, the, the basal stage of a lepidopter and like a moth or butterfly. And they utilize specific species. They fly down, they paralyze the caterpillar, and they sting it with their ovipositor, right? They don't kill it, they inject it with their eggs, and then they leave. And that caterpillar continues on its merry way until it is eaten from the inside out with the babies of the wasp. That's horrifying, right? Like, why would something like that evolve? And then you compare that to the beautiful, you know, uh, synchroneity of the evolution of, you know, a hummingbird and an orchid, or uh, not an orchid, a given flower, right? That's a beautiful symbiosis. But with every symbiosis case, there's a parasitism case, and that's deeply dark. And and I, I think you might be able to make it work if, if you're looking at it sort of from the, the, the fallen world perspective that I tend to see from a lot of folks in sort of the, the uh, Abrahamic religions that something has gone wrong, and that's why evolution has taken this darker turn. But man, <laughs> that's a hard sell oh, yeah. for larger pods, I think. The other good example is the cuckoo bird, you know, the one that's yeah. sort of, oh, that's horrible too. I mean, it, it, there's horrible examples about that. And if it's going to be a design, um, then you're going to have to, uh, but maybe this is part of the design. Maybe, as you said, the falling nature of, of man has let a uh, few of these things, but uh, yet to be uh, proved in my opinion, but we're still, I think naturalism is better, um, better explains the data we have right now, which is kind of indifferent I don't even see them as evil or good anymore. I just see them as that's what they are. Well, when, when I was a kid, you know, we, we'd watch nature documentaries sometimes when in class, like for biology or science class when you were growing up. And, you know, I had a lot of friends who would feel really bad for the deer when the, you know, the antelope, when the lions would take down a baby gazelle or something. And, and it was really heartbreaking. But at the same time, there was another part of me that would then see, okay, well, this is a mother lion and it's got babies mm -hmm. to feed. And you also want the baby, the baby lions, the kittens to, to have something to eat. And, you know, we think about the things we're willing to do as humans to make sure to guarantee the well-being of the folks that we love and care about. And when you look at it that way, is a parasitic wasp 
really that different? I mean, it, it seems different because it's a small brained arthropod, right? But it, it's the same concept, it's just scaled down. Um, and if I was a mother wasp, I would probably do the same thing as, as grotesque as it is to us. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I also don't see this good and evil. Nature just is, right? There, there's not, we can't really ascribe anything to it, any, any morality to it. Although that leads to some interesting questions because there are animals other than humans that present what I would argue as a primatologist, right, is, is either morality or people tend to call it proto-morality. I think that's kind of silly because what is it other than true morality? If there's punishment within a group for bad behavior that hurts the group that an individual is doing and then they get beat up on by their friends, which happens in vervet monkeys and camels monkeys and chimpanzees, what is that if not a very basic understanding of morality? Well, why do we have to separate it into proto-morality? Because we're, we're judging them by our standards, and which is right. really stupid yeah. and silly, and and and, our, and our, the way we've evolved. As a matter of fact, if we we do that to ourselves when we go back in history, or how about that? We might go back, or well, in the future, a few hundred years from now, we're going to look at ourselves right now and say, "Do you imagine humans used to slit the throat of animals so they can feed on their flesh?" And that yep. would be, "My God, look, there were these savages." <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's something I, I struggle with myself. You know, I, I try to reduce my meat consumption as much as possible. I still eat meat. You know, I, I had, um, what I have for dinner tonight? I had chicken with my pad thai tonight, uh, pad you tonight. It's a Thai food and there's chicken in it, right? I, I probably could have done without the chicken, but I like it. And that's probably not good, right? I've got a question for you, which is chicken related. And, and uh, one of the people actually um, um, asked me in my podcast the other day, I did not have the answer. And I promised them that I'll give them the answer. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, I, I'm sure you will be giving me the answer. Uh, we know that chicken uh, could be the, uh, the, the, the most recent version of um, dinosaurs, apparently <laughs> namely the T-Rex. Uh, and, and the question was, if these animals were actually truly extinct, like they're completely gone after that um, a meteor in, in a 60, some 63 or 65 million years ago, how come they've survived or some of them survived to give birth or to evolve into chickens? Well, yeah, I mean, okay, so so that's a difficult, we got to kind, of, kind of break that question down, right? Because modern chickens don't exist in the wild. The, the big breasted, you know, massive chickens with so much meat on them that produce a hundred eggs a day or however much they, that's the result of artificial selection. So modern chickens descend from the jungle fowl, which it's like a little tiny ground chicken <laughs> that existed um, 12, 12,000, maybe, maybe a little bit more recently than that uh, years ago. And these guys lay an egg couple weeks every month something like that it's it's effectively i hate to draw this comparison because it's not a one-to-one -one, but it's more akin to menstruation than anything else it's basically just like if they don't mate they have to shed that that um current version of the offspring that they would have had and that is a fertilized egg right um and and so these these jungle fowl i would propose are no more closely related and i don't know this for sure because we don't we don't have the dna of, of a t-rex <laughs> but exactly. I don't know that the chicken or the jungle fowl is any more closely related to a T-Rex than a duck or a hummingbird or a hawk or a, a bearded you know, vulture or anything like that. Um, however, all modern birds, and, and people tend to be kind of shook up by this, but all modern birds, they just are dinosaurs, right? Like the law of monophyly holds. If modern birds evolved from dinosaurs, they are still dinosaurs in the same way that we evolved from a mammal and we're still males, right? So modern birds truly are kind of derived theropods. So the question is, well, why are they like that? Why do, why have they evolved to be basically all tiny? And I would argue two things. One, this is a very recent thing because until humans arrived on the island of New Zealand and um, and with the elephant birds, I believe that's Southeast Asia and Australia, until we killed off the moas and uh, the terror birds, the elephant birds and things like that, there were really big birds that were still alive, right? That, that are descendants of the dinosaurs, 12 foot tall critters with giant beaks that were preyed upon in New Zealand, Moa, by Hossil, yeah. which was a bird the size of like a Cessna. I mean, these things were huge and they, they were eagles. Um, so are the dinosaurs gone? No, 
you could even make the argument that because birds are more biodiverse today than mammals are, that they're still doing better than we are. So why are they so small? And the answer to that, I think, is very simple. After the KPG extinction, this big asteroid comes, slaps into the world, annihilates all the dinosaurs, marine reptiles, not all the dinosaurs, all the non-avian dinosaurs, marine reptiles are also toast. And a lot of really cool critters like ammonites are, are also taken down with them. They're very tragic and sad. The survivors of this mass extinction are the burrowers, right? Mammals that live underground and birds that live in the banks of rivers, right? burrowing duck-like critters. Um, most of these guys still had teeth, interestingly enough. So I think what's going on with this is immediately after the KPG extinction, the radiation of birds from these sort of ancestral duck-like critters, for whatever reason, it just took longer than the mammals. The mammals beat them to it. And it's easy to think of mammals as, oh, you know, mammals take forever to reproduce. Rats don't. And the very first mammals were very similar to rodents. So they would have been reproducing like crazy, radiating out into all of these new niches, evolving to fill these brand new open jobs, basically, um, and adapting to their given environments. And from that, you get a lot of these really strange early mammals the first of the carnivorans, the first of the primates, right? The first of the proboscideans, these elephant-like creatures. Um, Barotherium, I believe is what it's called. I think it's very good. Um, and birds just kind of lag behind. That doesn't mean that they're not ridiculously successful, because again, there's way more types of bird than there are types of mammal. And we got to keep that in mind. And curiously enough, the most diverse types of mammals are rodents and chiropterans, which are the bats. And then mm -hmm. primates are the so it's not like the world is run by cool saber tooth cat, you know, cats or, or mammoths or anything like that. It, it's, it's always these little highly diverse guys. Um, so the long answer to your question, <laughs> the really long story short answer to your question is dinosaurs are still around. Uh, according to, you know, basic understanding of biology, they're just a lot smaller. And is that being small a negative? Well, it depends on what you think the goal of evolution is, because if the goal of evolution is to produce as many versions of yourselves, as many genes as possible, then chickens have everybody needs because they are all over the planet. There are more chickens than there are cows or pigs or sheep or humans. So in that sense, dinosaurs still rule the earth, don't they? <laughs> they just have Yeah, them. well, in, in a way. Um which sort of uh, begs the question there, nothing is really truly extinct. Uh, Homo neanderthalensis, uh, then, who's sort of maybe up to 39,000 years ago, used to be with us. Uh, we now discover, and I think you guys have, um, uh, you talked about the Nobel laureate, I think the Swedish uh, scientist who uh, decoded the Homo neanderthalensis code and uh, uh, grab all the fragments of it, if we truly have still 2% of its uh, DNA in our human genome, then maybe they're not really, really gone. Well, yeah, I mean, that, is, that asks some very interesting questions. When when paleogenomics was first getting started, Sante Pablo did not have anybody on his in his corner. I mean, everybody was like, you're going to try to get DNA from an extinct hominid? Are you insane? There's no way. It can't be done. Um, and yet he pulled so much DNA from these guys. He sequenced the first Neanderthal genome. And just about a month and a half ago, a new paper came out that doubled our number of full gen Neanderthal genomes. Uh, and it were, I believe, 23, 24 full genomes of, of people that lived and had dreams and hopes and hobbies and things that they enjoyed and families that lived 40 to 800,000 years ago, <laughs> which is incredible to think about. I mean, are they gone? You, you said 2%. That's the average. So you can have up to 5% of Neanderthal in your genome. Not only that, but Denisovans, the sister species to Neanderthals, can get as high as 12% in Southeast wow. Asian populations. Um, so, so are they gone? I don't think so. Not by a long shot. I, I mean, we carry, we carry the indelible stamp, as it were. Um, and that leads to the question, well, what what makes us human, right? Like what separates us from everything else? And again, as I said, with the color gradient, if you were to have a perfect fossil record from humans since our last common ancestor chimps, and you were the perfect fossil record, you laid them all out, the world's greatest expert with the world's most forefront of technology could not tell where humanity starts, humans start, and what comes before ends. Because it happens gradually. Are Neanderthals human? Are Denisovans? Is Homo erectus? Is Homo habilis? What about Homo naledi? Just, just um, yesterday, 
Lee Berger reported, Lee Berger um, studies hominoleti, a hominin with a 600cc brain case size out of South Africa. To tell you guys something that's cool about this, right? So we have humans, our brain case size, so the size of our skulls and our brains inside is about 1200 cc's, that's big. Chimpanzees are about 350, roughly a third or a fourth of our brain case size, right? Quite a bit smaller. So through human evolution, we see from our last common ancestor of humans and chimps, uh, people tend to propose something a little bit earlier than say Olympus genensis, the emergence of big brains. And for a long time, it was thought that big brains that means that you're human, because if you're a big brain, you, you have a, a behavioral toolkit and complexities, uh, socially speaking, it matches the modern human. Cool, that makes sense, that's easy. And then we found two hominins in the past two decades, Homo floresiensis and Homo naledi. Homo floresiensis is a three and a half foot tall hobbit hominin that looks very similar to modern humans, except its brain is 350 cc's, the same size as a chimpanzee, and it is dated to 60,000 years ago. We, we met this thing. We would have encountered it on the island of Flores. It used tools, right? It had its own complex tool culture. It lived in caves. It was had dexterous hands. This thing was an intelligent hominin, and we haven't pulled DNA from it yet, but it's probably not all that far off from humans. It may be in Homo erectus split off or Homo habilis split off, and yet this thing's got a small brain. So how is it capable of using all those tools? Chimps don't do that. And then we found Homo naledi. Homo naledi is from the Dinaledi caves in South Africa. This thing, this thing's a real, a real, where do I even start with this? The Homo naledi is this hominin and it looks very similar to humans from the waist down, identical from the waist down. From the waist up, it has ape-like shoulders. It has modern hands. It has a prognathic snouty looking face, much like a chimpanzee, small canine teeth, and its brain case size is 600 cc's, half that of a modern human. And yet when Lee Berger discovered the Dinaledi cave, um, he didn't discover it, but he, he's the one who sort of explored it more. He found that the cave was entirely populated with the remains of Homo naledi. This is unusual because cave um, recoveries, assemblages of these ancient hominids are usually mixed. There's, they're, they're predator kill sites. So there's Homo naledi and then there's, you know, elephants and antelope and small, you know, canids and felids and all sorts of different stuff. It's only naledi in here. So Berger used that as an opportunity to say, I think that these things are intentionally burying their dead. They are being put there by other members of their species in the middle of this cave, right? And people were like, understandably, where's the proof for that, Lee? Right? Like, how, how do you have the support for that? Because how are they seen? It takes modern humans an hour to get back to this chamber in the back of the cave with headlamps. How do you suppose that a 600 cc brain hominin was getting better while dragging a dead body? And last night, Lee Berger reported at Carnegie, and he reported the um, the presence of hearths and ash on the ceiling, which means that Homo naledi was using fire, and that's probably how it got back there with its dead. Why was it doing that? We don't know. But this thing looks like, I mean, this thing is chimp-faced. It, it looks like an ape in its face, a non-human ape. And yet here it is doing behaviorally complex human things. And it's dated to 250,000 years ago. It lived at the same time as modern humans. 300,000 so years ago. We're, we're, this is quite interesting because we know for a fact that the uh, Homo sapiens um, uh, brain size has actually declined over uh, yeah. the, the years. It's gone from 1500 CC to, uh, I think we lost about 10%, 1350. And the Homo neanderthalensis had even bigger brain, about 1750. Yes. Uh, does it mean that the nature is responding to the issue uh, created by bipedalism, the fact that we used to walk on four and given birth was a lot easier. Now we walk on two and the size of the human brain is bigger, making it really, really difficult and for birth. And uh, this is now our response to say, well, we can make brain smaller, yet um, uh, more intelligent by maybe uh, do the concentration of the synapses in a different way or the Bingo. neurons. Yeah. Cha-ching. That's exactly what it is. I'm, I'm in a brain evolution class right now. Uh, it's been a really interesting class, and I've had to read a whole lot on the evolution of brain case size, comparative anatomy, and general anatomy and physiology of the brain uh, in humans, other apes, other mammals, and endocasts from the past. And that decrease is very interesting because there's, oh man, there's so much interesting stuff to talk about about the evolution of the brain because size does not equal intelligence, not necessarily. There's a correlation, 
right? Because bigger brains, especially for the body side, it, okay, back up. Big brains, that doesn't mean anything. A big brain for your body size is what matters. Humans have big brains for our body size, right? But let's take it back in time. All primates from lemurs to tarsiers to baboons to humans have big brains for their body size, right? It's a primate characteristic. Take it a little bit further within the circopith, or excuse me, within the catarines. All catarines have big brains for their body sizes, even compared to other primates. And within the catarines, apes have huge brains for their body sizes compared to all of the other catarines, all of the other primates, and all of the other mammals. And the pinnacle of this is humans. We have astronomically large brains for what we need to do. Why are they big? This is unnecessary. There are other animals with big brains for their body size and they get along just fine without jacking it up to 11 like we do. So what the heck is going on? And the interesting thing here is, you know, I tend to take a very specific hypothesis that I'll, I'll say in a second, but to set the stage here, it has to do with wiring, not overall size. So what seems to be going on is that there's an emphasis in the prefrontal cortex um, and frontal lobe. So it's not just arbitrarily that brains get big. It's that certain parts of the brain are emphasized. Now, the frontal lobe is the one of the four lobes of the brain, one of the four main lobes. You got your frontal, you have your parietals, your temporal, and in the back is your occipital. Neanderthals and humans, even back when we existed contemporaneously, Neanderthals still had bigger brains. They maxed out at 1,700 cc's, and humans maxed out, maxed out at 1,500 cc's. But the parts of the brain that were emphasized were different. In Neanderthals, the occipital lobe that was huge. The occipital lobe is this lobe in the back. It's responsible for vision. It's responsible for hand-eye coordination, color, right? Tracking motion. These guys would have killed us in absolutely any Olympic sport that involves hand-eye coordination. They were, would have been incredible. But humans emphasize the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe of the brain is responsible for executive function, self-actualization, critical thinking, right? This is a vastly different emphasis that results in different strengths, right? And what the idea is right now is that when the climate changed roughly 40 to 60,000 years ago, when Neanderthals were starting to pitter out, they were great specialists, but they couldn't handle the change. They weren't innovators like humans were. And Homo sapiens was capable of, while not excelling side by side with Neanderthals, they were capable of adapting. In a, in a superior way. We didn't need the bigger brains because we emphasized it in the frontal lobe. In addition to that, there was also a paper that came out, oh gosh, when would it be? Maybe a month and a half, two months ago now, that actually isolated a very specific difference in the Neanderthal brain versus the archaic Homo sapiens brain, so 300,000 years ago humans, versus humans today. And one guy stands out of these three and it's modern humans. Modern humans have a mutation. It's like a single, I think it's like a leucine to an arginine, but I can't remember. It's a single substitution. And what it resulted in is a tripling of radial glial cells, which are responsible for creating more neurons, right? So this effectively jacks up the amount of neurons and neural density in humans at some point in our own evolution that didn't happen until human, Homo sapiens was already an established species. So early humans didn't have it. Neanderthals didn't have it. Homo fluorescensis didn't have it. Homo naledi didn't have it. Denisovans didn't have it. Halbergensis didn't have it. Erectus didn't have it. But at some point in Homo sapiens, we got it. And for whatever reason, we're still here. Now, whether there's a one-to-one -one correlation with this, a unique difference in the human brain that appears sometime in human evolution, uh, combined with our emphasis on the frontal lobe, combined with the changing climate, combined with chance, I think is responsible for why we're here and why they're not. Um, it's an interesting question to ask. And, and then of course, it's why, why get big brains in the first place, right? What about big brains is so good? What, what about big brains in-, in considering, considering the cost, it's very, it's very costly uh, enormous, organ. It's, it's, yeah, mm. Enormously costly. Uh, and my professor, the, the one who's teaching me this, this brain class, has, has proposed a very elegant solution, I think. Um, he, he wasn't the one that proposed it. Uh, it was proposed by, I have the um, I have the papers, but I don't remember the authors. Carol Ward is an author on one of them, and Peter something is an author on the other. But it, it basically proposes this idea of ecological dominance and social competition as the driver for big brains along with cooperative breeding and interestingly enough monogamy so take it back in time right we're, we're, we're with some random hominin 
pre-homo habilis. And for whatever reason, you know, you get a male and a female, and, and the male is incentivized in provisioning for the female because he can guarantee his paternity if he sticks around, and that's one kid guaranteed. So the two of them work together to raise the kid. Once you've got two individuals working together to raise a kid, it increases the fitness of that child because it has a higher likelihood of surviving. And if that pair bond stays together, then you increase the likelihood of all the subsequent offspring surviving. Now, critically, it's not just the, the pair bond between the two, it's also the incorporation of their family. Quite literally, it takes a village and the modern nuclear family in the West is, it, it's so taxing on a single couple. It, it, it is ridiculous. It's just not the way that nature intended it. Um, you really do need the help of aunts and uncles and grandparents and, you know, nieces and nephews to help take care of your kids because humans are born so helpless that they, they, they need 24 seven care. This is unique in the animal kingdom, um, especially for how long we do it. Compared to our yes. life. So you've got cooperative care for the, for the young with a, a pair bonded individual or pair bonded um, duo and their, their, their relatives, the, the individuals with them. With that in mind, right? You can provision. With provisioning, you need a single adaptation. You need the ability to basically fuel a brain that's a little bit bigger. And we're looking at early to late australopith, mid to late australopiths at this point, I would imagine. I don't know this for certain. This is very speculative, but this is just the, the model that I have been taught that I think is supported by the fossil record and the genetics that we have today. So you've got this group of, of hominins milling around and one of them picks up a, a bone and smacks it on the ground and there's marrow inside. Marrow is one of the most caloric, calorically rich, excuse me, uh, calorie dense is what I was going to say, parts of the body. If you have more calories, you can fuel a bigger brain, which means you can innovate tools, which means you can afford to find more calorie rich sustenance, which means you can grow a bigger brain, so you can get a bigger toolbox, so you can find more resources, you can grow it. You see what I mean? It, it, it tr essentially triggers a feedback loop. Yeah. Um, when your brain start advancing. And that's when you attain ecological dominance. This is the ability to basically manipulate the environment around you to such a degree that you don't have to fear the hostile forces of the outside as much as you do the inside. And this is when the transition occurs around homo erectus, which is the proposition, right? Maybe a little bit later, where we have fire, we have water skin, we have tools, right? And we live in groups that are large enough to deter predators that might want to kill us. So now the competition and everybody else outside of our species and outside of our group, it's everybody within the group. And that's what triggers a, a, a sort of additional increase in brain case size for social cohesion and social manipulation. And what, that what, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think of this idea, Eric? I've been having this idea for, for quite some time and I've kind of adopted it. Um, the, the change from ectotherms to homeotherms some 200 million years ago. And we know that the behavior of the reptilian, we're talking about the ancient brain sort of dominant. We're talking about some sort of care of the hatching eggs to be, but not as much bonding between mother and offspring. Uh, they, uh, they live to fend for themselves, but they've got to learn very, very, very quickly once they hatch. Uh, but uh, they will not learn too much throughout their life. The, the, the amount of skills they require is not as as as, as much. Uh, but uh, the homeotherms emerge, and the problem of food uh, has kind of been solved because they can eat day and night. They need to re they can regulate uh, their body temperature through um, uh, metabolism rather than uh, just the normal climate out there. Uh, but for that to happen. Uh, uh, you know, you need to eat t 10 times. A uh, homeotherm will need to eat about 10 times uh, the size of man of food, that of an ectotherm. So it created a, a problem, a pressure on, on these creatures. So one of the things that they've sort of evolved into being obviously a, a, a mammal is a delayed maturity. The offspring of these new animals are um, uh, a lot more vulnerable. They needed the care for the mother so the, the, the nervous system is now uh, re-engineered with a, a pain and pleasure system because we know now that uh, oxytocin, are, are the, the, that hormone for bonding between mother and offspring is now emphasized. And it's very funny, it's even emphasized in the right areas for monogamous animals. Uh, uh, and there are animals that are not monogamous, but they are the emphasis in the um, oxytocin receptors are sitting on the, the tribe or the family, like in baboons. It's quite fascinating. So could it be that human 
especially now when we add that that new dimension of the the brain plasticity of humans and the fact that we can create new synapses with new learnings is that sort of a, a an a side effect of the mammals and humans being sort of an in the pinnacle of that where we get a lot of del way delayed maturity way delayed maturity but as in exchange for way learning bigger learning curve well well you're absolutely right so so the the mammalian growth trend or the mammalian sort of life cycle life history is a better way of putting it is an absolute precursor for what we see in humans humans are taking it and dialing up to 11. We're not the only ones with long childhood or with long life histories and, and sort of the semblance of a child because orangutans do that too. The, mm -hmm. the orangutan takes a long time to grow up because it, it lives with mom and it learns from mom. It's it's something like eight to 12 years that they stay with their parents, which and that's not that far off from a human. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's 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 fascinating that you bring up bonding, right? Because this is, this is absolutely critical. Humans pair bond. Um, and pair bonding is not unique to humans, um, although we do it in a strange way. So gibbons pair bond, right? Gibbons are my favorite, right? they're my favorite ape. I think they're great. And they form little pair bonds and, you know, calatrichins do this too. So tamarins and marmosets pair bond. Pre prairie uh, voles, I think prairie it. voles, prairie voles. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, lots of different, well, not lots of different, but a non-zero number outside of humans of mammals do pair bond. And pair bonding is absolutely critical, but what humans kind of do is we take the pair bond and we have it with our, our immediate mate, right? And then we also have it with kin and even friends. And what humans do that, you know, Robert Sapolsky, I like to bring this up because I, I think it's a, a good point to make. Robert Sapolsky is a famous primatologist and he characterized human behavior into three categories. The things that humans do that every other animal does, hormonal regulation, sleep, wake cycle, fight and flight, all sorts of stuff like that. Then there's the things that humans do that we take and we tweak it, right? So we have something that we're basically dialing up what other animals do to 11. Language is a perfect example of this. Language, what we're doing right now, this is just complicated vocalization, right? And it's it's definitely dialed up to 11, don't get me wrong. But other primates have, you know, grammar and syntax and complicated gestures that are indeed sort of seemingly um, some being learned and some being almost innate that mimic those that we see in human toddlers. Up to 90% of the gestures are one-to-one, -one, which is fascinating to think about. Um, and then Robert Sapolsky had a last singular category that he considered the things that humans do that are entirely unique. And he had basically one thing that he put into that category. And that was the ability of humans to emphasize across space and time. So plenty of animals emphasize, right? Um, we, we have empathy, or sorry, empathize is what I meant. Empathize. Plenty of animals empathize. Um, but humans are the only ones that empathize across space and time in that we can feel bad for events that we weren't even present for. I can see a description of the war. I can read All Quiet on the Western Front and I can feel emotion at that. I can see a picture of a cartoon dog and feel sad about that, right? That's not even something that's real and yet I can empathize with it. Um, so this is that bonding bonding and um, uh, theory of mind uh, relationship that's basically dialed up to 11. And of course it's this that allows us to have highly complicated social systems and it's what potentially, in my opinion, drives brain evolution, this ability to manipulate and deceive on one hand and also act spontaneously altruistically. We, we do these things for strangers. No, no other animal that I'm able to, that I can come up with an example of, does what humans do in the sense that not only will we help strangers, but we will help strangers that aren't even of our own species, right? Mm -hmm. Chips will help each other. Absolutely. They'll even help strangers. But mm -hmm. is a chimpanzee going to, to pick up and nurse a sick colobus monkey that it finds? I don't think so. I don't think that that's happened ever. And yet humans do it. So to the degree that after the domestication of dogs, dogs and humans have hijacked each other's bonding systems. So dogs and humans, when they make eye contact with one another, if it's your dog, you both release oxytocin. It's, it's a bonding hormone. We do the same thing with cats. Cats meow at a frequency that mimics an infant's cry, right? And we really saw oxytocin with that too. So we bond within our own species and we also bond across species. That's unique as far as I can tell. Now, this is critical. Humans are not the only animals that have unique aspects to them. 
I would propose every animal has its own unique thing that's yeah. part of its niche that makes it set apart from everything else. So this just happens to be a human thing. This, this doesn't mean that humans are set apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. It just means we've got one thing on everybody else just like chimpanzees have some stuff on us and some stuff i mean chimpanzees have the short-term memory of a god <laughs> they can be us oh yeah i've seen, seen the videos memory. They're incredible um and and empathy empathy the ability to empathize seems to be the, the situation with humans and it's very interesting that we we're not very strong humans we don't have very much upper arm strength we can run for a long time uh, but our strength when it comes to standing up to each other and to other species comes in our numbers. So empathy and the ability to get along and create coalitions and alliances and to love one another and create friendships. This is really important, not just because it's good and nice and there's this butterflies in our smoke, but it's critical to survival, right? If you're out on the savanna, you know, 1.5 million years ago, and you're with another member of your species, you better hope that they've got your back if Dinophilus mm -hmm. comes running around the corner, right? And they're not just going to ditch you. And yeah, there's an element of that. The reciprocal altruism isn't necessarily, I mean, they get a benefit too, because they're thinking when they help you, maybe you'll help me in return. But that doesn't mean that it's any less cool, in my opinion. So so to the long story short, to your answers, absolutely. The, the, the mammalian bonding is an absolute precursor to the level of sociality that we see in mammals. Now, birds are social too. They do it in a different way. But what we're seeing in mammals is a precursor for the human condition, but it's not just a precursor for the human condition. It's a precursor for the catarine condition, for the haplorine condition, for the primate condition. It's a precursor for the bonding that we see in, in carnivorans, the pack animals, in the potting that we see in cetaceans, in herd animals, right? Any kind of bonding as basic as you mentioned, is the bond between a mother and its offspring. And yes, this is an absolutely viable um, survival strategy because if you bond with your young and you care about them, their chances of survival skyrocket. Mm -hmm. And what humans have done with that is we have really tightened that gap down one kid at a time. We do it with a usually with a partner or with family. Um, even in cases with single parents, you're usually doing it with friends or close relatives, and you are putting all of that investment into one kid in the hopes that you guys will bond and it'll have a chance of survival. It's cool. It is cool. It is very cool, but you got to understand it in the context because one of the questions we're going to pose on you now is the misconception of that there is an understanding out there that, that humanity and humans is the pinnacle of evolution. Yeah. Every species is is, 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 is is scrambling and trying to get to be human. Uh, that's what everybody thinks, but uh, hopefully you will correct that understanding because to me, every single species, every single animal has evolved exactly right to suit their habitats. Uh, uh, and then a, a, a chimp is not necessarily going to be human um, uh, actually, it's not going to be human the way it's sort of the, the line of evolution. Uh, but there are a lot of people would actually still think that monkeys and apes or primates are actually eventually going to end up being humans, as if a human is the is the target here. Well, and and this is this is why I brought up other hominins, right? So so humans evolved. We emerge as a distinct species three hundred thousand years ago, right? Humans were not the first hominin, right? We weren't even the first member of our own genus. And our maximum, our maximum longevity is 300,000 years so far, right? That's not that long. Neanderthals were around for 800,000 years, and Aesivan's almost that long. Homo erectus, the, the hominin oh, that um, precedes or sort of directly precedes a lot of these more modern versions, this thing was around for 2 million years. Right. So if we want to categorize success, the pinnacle of evolution, how do we do it? Right. Is it by numbers? Well, then ants are the pinnacle of evolution. Right. Is it by longevity? Well, then we got to give it to sharks because sharks have been around since before trees evolved. Right. <laughs> Is it the complexity of relationships? Well, that might also go to some of the eusocial insects where you might have to give it to, to, you know, the mandrels that live in groups of 800 and can manage relationships all across these individuals. So what is exactly that makes humans um, 
sort of set apart. Well, it's, I hear this a lot. Humans are the only animals that build rockets and go to the moon. Oh, really? Are you going to build a rocket and go to the moon? Take 100 people. I don't care. Pick 100 people randomly on the planet. It doesn't matter which 100 it is, unless it's specifically a group working at NASA, right? They're not going to build a rocket and go to the moon. The success of humans is ent it's entirely dependent on others. We, we stand on the shoulders of giants. The folks that built Gebekli Tepe or Jericho or Rome were equally as intelligent as you and I, maybe even more. Um, but they didn't have the basis of previous knowledge to build upon. They did what they could with what they had. Hopefully people who come, if we live that long, a thousand years from now, won't look back and say, ah, those those stupid idiots in you know, the, the early 21st century, how, how dumb were they, right? It's like, no, we're just working with the information that we have. Um, so if you take it back in time, how much more intelligent really was a human living 300,000 years ago as compared to a Neanderthal? or as compared to Homo erectus, or as compared to Homo naledi, who's apparently burying its dead with fire, with a, a brain that's half the size of you and, I, you and I. I don't know, right? So the question then becomes like, why would anything evolve to become human, specifically Homo sapiens? What is it that, that totally sets us apart? Again, you, you could argue it's the empathy thing, but I don't know where that starts, do you? Um, what if Neanderthals had it? Uh, what if Homo erectus had it? Uh, we certainly know that there's some genetic differences between us and them, but we don't yet know how that reflects on behavior. If you gave Neanderthals another 300,000 years, would they have built rocket ships? What about Homo erectus, right? It, it, it's fascinating to think about, but I, I think that the fact that there were so many other hominins within the genus Homo, which Homo means man, right? These are humans, if you want to take that at, the, at its basic definition. They're, they're human. Why is their version of humanity worse than ours? They lived longer than us. They probably had hopes and dreams as well. They made art. They were capable of moving great distances, right, across the world. They could cooperate just like we did. Who, who knows the kinds of discoveries that are waiting down the line of, of, of sort of the, the technological advances that they had? I, I I think there's no reason to believe that Neanderthals didn't reach the level of archaic Homo sapiens, to be perfectly honest. Um, so I think that that's the, the best support against that is that you're right, organisms are perfectly suited to their environment. And is there really something so different about what humans are doing today that isn't just the result of cumulative culture? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I do know that if we're working on the basic principles of evolution, then organisms are constrained by their environment. They evolve to, um, they're basically evolving to best survive within their given habitat. So if that's the case, the second you get ecological dominance, selection reduces and selection is mostly placed by your conspecifics, the individuals around you. So I don't know. It's, it's where humans will go. I wonder if we'll look back if again, a thousand years from now and, and, and think less of where we are, where, are we evolving anywhere in particular? No. So there are a couple of ideas that I want to sort of end the conversation with, and, it, and it's going to sort of gather all the, the ideas we've, we've discussed today. Um, I will start with the human consciousness and, and the mind that is applying all these judgments on things because we, we can't help but judging things from our own perspective. What else can we do <laughs> other than, uh, uh, you know, and no, at least taxonomy, you know, and, and, and the issues around taxonomy and how do you classify things based on lots of genetic uh, appearance. Um, and, and it seems that uh, there isn't an objective answer to that. There, the, you've, you, you've got your brain and you've got your uh, your minds and you've got your experiences and there is no escaping that that's the only thing you can measure uh by uh because of our limitations we're not out we can't get outside of ourselves to see ourselves and others and become almost the gods that we've created uh, we can only judge from our own experience but knowing that no, uh, it then puts limitation on things that we might see or perceive things to be but they're not objectively like that. That's exactly how we see, like we see colors, but colors aren't there, but they're quite useful. Uh, they're quite a useful illusion. Um, uh, could it be that um, 
you know, and maybe maybe you can shed some light on taxonomy and where are we at with that? Are we still having that big debate on how do we really classify classify new species? Oh man, um, you're asking somebody who might have a controversial answer for that. Um, I <laughs> I have a complicated stance on species. I don't think that species are distinct real biological categories. I think that if, if you had a perfect situation, if you had the entire fossil record, if you had the entire living record of animals, it's always going to be a color gradient. So I can draw a line around a color gradient, a certain section of a color gradient and say, this is what I will classify as red. And then directly adjacent, this is what I will classify as scarlet. And then right adjacent to that, this is going to be orange. And someone else might come along and they might say, well, what about the very edges, right where scarlet meets red or right where scarlet meets orange, right? How do you know that you're not goofing a little bit and that they sort of dip into each other because life is a gradient just like that it, it is impossible i think if we were to have a perfect sample of life to define species in my opinion species are very useful tools for understanding life as humans but ultimately if you had the entire fossil record all the way back to the last universe of common ancestor no one if you had the genetics if you have the fossils themselves could point at where humans begin where mammals begin where fish begin where sharks begin where eukaryotes begin because these animals will bleed these organisms i should say will bleed into one another that is simply the nature of inheritance and adaptation so <laughs> as far as taxonomy and species it depends on the concept you're using because if you want to use the biological species concept, which is what most people use, things are really cut and dry. If things can interbreed and produce viable offspring, they're the same species. The problem with that is some ligers are fertile. So lions and tigers are the same species, right? You know, lens. I'm glad you said that because I thought I was going crazy because I, when I tell, this is what I tell people. I, I think species is a human construct. Oh, it's yeah. An I agree. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. It's almost like, but it's quite useful. It's like when you're referring to yourself and say, when I was 21, yeah. when, no, it's like these milestones that you can refer back to and they're quite useful. But they actually, there isn't a point, you know, the, it, the, your, your own life is made of that continuous, uh, ever-changing perspective. But we can't help but pointing back at a certain milestone saying, here, uh, this thing stops and the new thing begins. But as a matter of fact, I see the whole thing as a as a spectrum of, of, of all these 50 shades of gray that are always, always there. And they, there isn't a distinct point. I tend to agree with you. And there's an excellent piece out there. It's Zakos 2016, I believe. Um, a, a famous guy who went out there and categorized all these sort of species concepts into one. And his big conclusion is he's like, we don't have a species concept that works for everything. Evolutionary species concept works great for fossils, not so much for living things. The biological species concept has the exact opposite problem, right? These, these concepts work great in isolation and they work spectacularly for communication. When I say I saw a bear, you know exactly what I mean, right? If I say I saw a polar bear, you know even more exactly what I mean there. Right. We can do this with dogs. We can do this with with, with um, people living for in certain parts of the world. We have these categories that we sort of fit things in. And that's right in line with humans being pattern seekers. Right. We like to categorize things and try to draw lines to make sense of them. But I also know that there are a lot of people, including my advisor, <laughs> um, who, who disagree with this sentiment. They do think that there's something to species. But this is not by any means like a like a universally accepted concept. And I tend to lean very much on the side of it's 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 useful, but it is not yes. real in the sense that we think I'm of agreeing. a genome being real, right? Yes, I'm I'm completely in agreement with you, and I think it's going to take us to the last point of what's next. And here's a, is a, an, an interesting comment about AI and would it be considered a, a species? I don't think it will be considered a species because it's not a, it's not a Mrs. Grin uh, model of a, of a biological living thing. However, 
our evolution, I'm very interested in the question of our evolution. And we're going to try to speculate here and, and imagine because we, there are a few people that would actually said, well, oh, you know, the, the teeth have issues. They might be fused together in the future. Uh, the feet and we might lose a toe, uh, the way the hands are formed, uh, the eyes are going to get bigger. There are a few, all these so, sort of speculations about the future. Um, and do you think, uh, I mean, I'd like you to address all of that, but do you think AI at some point, and I'm talking about a cyborg here, where the part, and I think it's already happening. We, we, we've seen people with bionic arms, so um, right. it's, it, it's already started to happen. But eventually, is it going to be a somewhere where... Uh, you can look at somebody in 500 years time and say, well, this is half man, half machine type of person. I, so th that's an interesting question. Um, I, to be quite frank, I mean, if, if I'm being consistent here and saying that species are simply a useful way to categorize life, I see no reason as to why you couldn't extend that to different kinds of life. I don't think that AI is necessarily biological life. Is it life? Maybe, right? What if we found silicon? cone based life would, would that be life i don't know i mean i i think that life can take more forms than just sort of our narrow scope that we have here on earth and as a result if you expand that scope species can expand with it again though because species are in my opinion you know real constructs right they're not real in the sense of like a, a tangible objective line that can be drawn when does something go from being human to being cyborg, right? It's like a Theseus ship problem. What if you replace half the body, you know, exactly? Are you human? Are you cyborg? Are you robot? What, what, what do you become? Um, and what if we start doing the transhumanism, right? Where we say, okay, well, we're gonna stick a colony on Pluto. And if we're sticking a colony on Pluto, we need to have bodies that are more adapted for that kind of gravity and that temperature and the UV radiation that we experience out there whatever that may be, depending on the atmosphere conditions of Pluto. What if we engineer ourselves, right? When, when does that become a different species? So, I mean, I think the future of humanity is, we're at a really critical point right now. Um, this is make or break time for our mm -hmm. species, I think. We have to figure out on our planet, one, how to get along, and two, how to manage our resources, both of which we're doing a really bad job at. So. I'm not sure, I hope we figure it out. I have the hope that we will. And if we can figure it out, humanity could be an incredible force you know, within our own solar system and beyond with regard to exploration. I find that to be just very romantic, this idea of, of humans breaking free of, of where it is that we were born and, and shaped and exploring you know, the cosmos. That, that would be the greatest, the greatest dream of all time achieved. But getting there is going to be another story. We, we have to figure our, our stuff out, right? And I don't know that, that we're there yet. But, it, you know, we can dream. We can sit here and speculate. I love speculative evolution. I think it's really fun. And I think yes. that if you take, so if you take the human hand out of it, or if the human hand is in, organisms are always going to be suited for the environment that they are dwelling in, right? That's going to be the goal. So if we move to a place with higher gravity, we're going to get shorter, squatter, bones are going to be more robust. If the atmosphere is particularly thin, we'll probably get thicker, you know, corneas and lidding on the eyes in order to protect our exposed mucous membranes from radiation and drying out. Um, I can imagine that if we move to colder places, we might redevelop some of our, our thicker fur cover, or if we move to places that are even warmer, we might lose the hair on our heads and develop higher, you know, uh, sort of uh, efficiencies with sweating and thermal regulation. There's a million different places you can take this. And it's so exciting to think about, you know, if, if we can cross that line, not only where we'll take ourselves, but where could we take the rest of life on Earth? And that, that raises some interesting questions as to, you know, conservation. Do, do we conserve organisms that are going to extinct? I love the idea, but it's also fighting nature a little bit. Do we bring organisms back that went extinct? If we could do it, I'd love it. But is that not also fighting nature yeah. a little bit um maybe maybe there is a reason they're extent in the first place they're very exciting questions but um uh, and i think i'm going to end with 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 the definition of life because uh as you mentioned before there is a bit of something a bit difficult to explain what life is uh they've given it's you know the mrs grimm model the seven characteristics of uh, yeah. you know responsive yes. stimuli but there was a very interesting book written by edwin Trid Tridinger. The guy who, uh, you know, the Schrodinger cats, 
yeah, uh, yeah. Book alive in it. and it's called what what's life and uh, i kind of tend to agree with him he's a physicist and he's getting into the realm of biology and he said well life maybe life has also evolved from simple simpler uh, uh requirements for things to be called life uh, it did not need to be as complex of so mrs grin is a, is a seven characteristics of, of modern living things but the first living thing might have just needed to display only two things you know the, it, it being being sustaining itself and being able to make copies of itself and now been have been enough look at viruses are viruses alive we can't decide we don't know yeah. and, and these things are everywhere viruses absolutely saturate our world and we don't know if they're alive or not so you know with something that is distinctly maybe alive and maybe not i don't think it's it's unreasonable in the slightest to propose that the first life was probably preceded by things that were a little bit alive <laughs> and yeah. maybe a little bit not. Um, and all that you really need to happen uh, in the very first place, right, is organization. And that happens in simple chemistry. Simple chemistry yeah. organizes itself. It wants to go from more chaotic to more stable. And you simply need the right conditions. I, I suspect, I really do believe that in my lifetime, we will see the the advent of, of synthesis of very simple life in a lab. That, to, to reiterate, that doesn't mean that someone didn't trigger it. That doesn't negate religion. However, it does create an interesting sort of quandary here because it, it sort of sets the stage for what I think is going to happen, and I suspect I'll get to see it before I die. The argument will shift. It, it will become God created the conditions for life. Not life, but the conditions for life. And I think when you get right down to the brass tacks, the philosophy of that is a bit troubling to me. Um, it's, it's. Uh, I guess that's the reason I'm an agnostic. <laughs> uh, I have a theory that consciousness has emerged as a necessi necessity for uh, the search for food. Uh, you are more successful looking for food if you're, if you're conscious. And, and that's probably a different kind of conversation because it is a long lead towards it. But if machines uh, uh, need energy, just like, like just like the Matrix, you know, the who sort of harvested humans for their uh, body heat and for energy, so they can actually grab energy eventually. So that's food because energy is food. That's what we think food f food is actually energy. And then in the search for energy, would a machine then, in search for more energy, and cut the umbilical cord with with uh, with their creators? develop consciousness is that is that a possibility i don't see why not i i mean i to be perfectly honest i, I find some of the stuff that's coming out of these these ai projects compelling and unsettling because what is what is a human if not a very complicated response stimulus and pattern seeker right we look at everything around us and, and we create a narrative and we try to understand it we try to find a through line and like there's some AI out there right now that seems to be capable of doing some basic versions of that. At what point does consciousness start and response stimulus end? Is there a point where it starts versus ends? My personal philosophy is consciousness is not an on-off switch. It's a gradient, much like everything else in life. Um, and so organisms that are aware, as you've said, they're better at surviving than organisms that aren't. A worm is aware, right? Um, is it as conscious as a human? I don't think so. But is it conscious? Depends on how you define consciousness. Yes, agreed. Um, uh, I, we know it's happened once before uh, in a biogenesis. So in animates, it's turned into an animate at some point. So why not again? <laughs> yeah, and, and again, that, that point at which it goes from what we describe as inanimate to animate, there's a hole in between there, right? And it wouldn't surprise me if we looked back in 50 or 100 years and said some of the stuff that was going on, you know, in, in 2022 was very in between <laughs> some of those some of those programs. And, you know, that's I don't know what to think about that. I, I find it fascinating, but it's also kind of um, it's also kind of Lovecraftian, this idea of something that wakes up and it it's just trying to make sense of the world around it. And then you're kind of like, is that not what we what we are, right? We, we just wake up and we're like trying to figure out what's going on. Erica, I would like to end with, uh, I, know, I know you're 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 finishing your PhD 
And one of the things, and, and I really, I mean, please, please be an educator, science educator. The amount of energy you enthuse on, on, on screen and everybody that will listen to you, you make, I think, I'm, I'm excited just chatting with you uh, about the prospects of things, about thinking about things. Is that your plan for your future? Are you going to be a science educator? Are you going to work at university? It would be very hard to shut me up about this kind of stuff. Whether I educate um, on YouTube, I would, the goal, the dream job would be to get a research professor gig where I do, you know, research in the summers and teach during the fall and in the spring and then continue with my YouTube career. Because I, I feel, again, like I feel so lucky to have access to all this information. It constantly blows my mind. It just makes me so grateful to live in the time period that I live in where all of this information is just seemingly at my fingertips. I just get so hyped about it. I want to tell everybody who will listen. Um, and and I try to pump that into to the classes that I teach now. And I feel like it's going pretty well. I had a group of, of fraternity boys in our last class today who, who came up and said, I can't believe it, but I but I actually learned some stuff in this class. And I was like, oh my God, that's actually the goal. Like, I, I really want that. I, I want to spread this information because I think the more that we know, um, the more that we crave to know more, it's like the world's healthiest addiction, right? We all want to yes. know more about the world around us. And in doing that, uh, we learn more about ourselves and we learn more about each other. And and that is what propels us forward ultimately as a species. Uh, because I, I would perhaps argue that that's another thing that, that makes humans unique. It's this ability to wonder um, and wonder in all of these different ways uh, that, that have kind of put us where we are today, arbitrary things, right? We, we create art just for the hell of it. And, and I think that's so cool um, and, and really does it, it just makes me happy, you know. I, so I'm glad that the I'm glad the enthusiasm is infectious because while it's not necessarily what I'm going for, I, I kind of get lost in my I kind of work myself up and get more and more excited. It always just tickles me pink to hear that that people get excited when I'm getting excited because I think it's worth getting excited for. And, and, and I promise this is the very last question. You refer to yourself as an, an agnostic throughout the conversation. Mm. Uh, and again, there's mis, mis um, understanding about the, the uh, concept of what it means. Because a lot of people think it's a 50-50 situation. Mm. Is it the 50-50 situation with you? Or is it that you are adopting this stance because it is the most reasonable and it's the one that leaves you open to new knowledge as they come in? It's, it's just unambiguously the second category. I, I truly believe that that it is an honest position to hold. I think that the the most the most transparent and I guess honest really is the best word position to have is, is to say I don't know when, when you don't know something. I think the world could use a lot more people saying I don't know when we don't have the answer. Um, because not only does does it show, you know, it, it kind of puts you in the context of everybody else and in the context of the world at large, but it also shows where, where we could learn more. By saying, I don't know, it means there's a lapse in knowledge there and, and we can know more. As far as the, the supernatural, I, I guess I would say I'm an agnostic because I've puzzled and puzzled and puzzled over it. And I think that there are aspects to the supernatural that not only do I not know, I don't know that I can know. I don't know that it's knowable. It might be, but but the fact that there is that there is doubt there for me leaves me to, to say I'm an agnostic. I'm not sure, and I guess that's why science is so um, is so attractive to me because it, it is more steadfast in, in what it says. Science, of course, doesn't say we know this for a fact. We we absolutely have this down, and nothing could ever change that. The mutability of science is definitively, in my opinion, its greatest strength, the fact that it can change and morph with new information that comes to light. Uh, but that being said, I do like the idea of saying, we're trying to figure out XYZ, we'll test it using ABC, and now we either have support for it or we deny it. And the concept of, yeah. of you know, interdimensional cosmic deities doing things far beyond my comprehension, it's a little above my head, to be honest. And, and I, I try to stay uh, humble about that in that I, I don't think that I could that I'm my feeble apish brain is capable capable of understanding the machinations of someone who's pulling all the strings if they are in fact pulling all the strings. Fair enough. But but you, you're not agnostic about certain type of gods have been already um, given, like the Abrahamic god. Um, you still I, can be still agnostic about that. Yeah, that's that's tough. From what I from what I understand, 
I think we can make a pretty good case that most of the organized religions as we present them are not going to be reflective of reality. Um, my Gnosticism is more in the, the bigger, more yes. deism. Is there a deity? Is there, and then when I say deity, I simply mean something above human comprehension that is capable of interacting with the world that we live in, not even necessarily people, but just the, the world that we, that we interact with. But yeah, I mean, like, do I have any, is there really any doubt in my mind that like the literal interpretation of, of the Bible as typically proposed by you know, Western evangelicals is incorrect? I'm about as sure about that <laughs> as I can be about anything. Um, and, and that's just because all of reality just balks at it. All of reality just balks at it. For, for that to be the case, God would have to be so deceptive that it would violate, then it's paradoxical, right? Because he violates the character that he's proposing that he had. I mean, Correct. so those two things don't really go hand in hand for me. Um, and from what I understand really about the Abrahamic religions and some of the, the Eastern religions as well, uh, is that we, we don't have support for them and we also have some support against them. So, you know, I tend to take a firmer stance on that, but I don't think I would would ever be so confident as to say there is definitely um you know no higher entity than humans that has ever or will ever exist i just don't have enough confidence in my own knowledge to say that oh fair enough and that, that's a very respectable stance and it's a good stance as well because it leaves you open to being surprised by the events of life it's a lot more uh, curious and a lot more exciting to live that way i think truly yeah it is very exciting it, it is and you know when especially when weird stuff in cosmology happens because i don't understand cosmology very well especially that quantum physics just blows my mind sometimes <laughs> someone will come out of quantum physics and they'll say something and then i'm like okay i need to find a youtube video that will break this down in a way that i can wrap my brain around it because i don't understand what's going on um and you know that's the nice thing about biology at least for me it, it i feel like it comes a lot easier than some of that you know, string theory, quantum mechanics stuff that is just, yeah. I, I, mean, do, a, I do a little bit of that as well in my channel. I do, I, I like quantum mechanics. I do have physicists like Lawrence Krauss that comes oh, regularly. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. yeah, and tomorrow I have Michael Shermer uh, oh, talking about his new book. Uh, yeah, and he's going to be talking about why intelligent be people believe in stupid things. Oh, that's <laughs> that means... Oh, man. So, so you guys are going to be going for six or seven hours, huh? <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's a, he's a, definitely somebody that I, I look up to and um, in the realm of psychology. Uh, but Erica, this has been one of my favorite conversations ever. This is this is exciting. It was so nice and organic. We didn't really discuss much beforehand. We're um, I know we've been trying to get this conversation going for for a number of weeks and oh, been very very busy. <laughs> to, to be perfectly honest with you, this is this is probably the busiest probably five months that I've of my entire life. I, I wow. I'm in my second year of my PhD. So I gathered data that I'm having to organize that I collected over the summer. I had a full class load. I was teaching three labs. I'm head TA, which absolutely annihilated me. I, this is my first semester being head TA too. So I'm like doing stuff. And I have no idea how any of it works. Um, and then I'm also trying to, to, to organize my travel grants for next year. I submitted for the ABAs. It's just been steamrolling me over. So I'm so glad, but I was, you know, I'm so glad. And, I, you, and you got married. And, and I got, got married. married. <laughs> <laughs> that one, once that was done, though, then it was, we were smooth sailing. Once that was done, we were smooth sailing. But, you know, my summer, I didn't have a second to breathe. I didn't get anything done over the summer except getting married and going to Kenya and, you know, basically working on my dissertation. It was like absolutely exhausting. The good news is, next semester is going to be a lot easier for me because my class i'm almost done with my coursework so my class load has really chilled out i'm taking dissertation hours so i'm very glad i'll have actually more time i mean i was barely squeaking out youtube videos <laughs> this semester I know, I know. Yeah. barely getting them out so I, I really am glad that that we that we managed to make this work because i know it was 
I'm, I'm a, I've been a nightmare to deal with this semester as far as scheduling. So I, I appreciate your patience and uh, flexibility with me on that. It was well worth it. And I'll, I'll leave you for a few, few months and, and hopefully we'll uh, invite you again to maybe next time to talk about something really specific, hold on into uh, a specific issue. But uh, once again, I really, from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to thank you so much for your time today uh, and your energy. Uh, I'm a big fan, big fan of your work. I uh, love your channel. Uh, one more time, guys, if I'm just going to um, uh, share uh, Erica's channel. And I'd like you to please have a look and subscribe because it's got multiple of very interesting and useful videos. And, and I like the way that you, you don't keep them too long. They're nice and, and short and you keep them to, to the topic you, you're trying to discuss. Well, that, that's when I, you have to understand, those ones are when I've got like an idea and I want to get it out. Ooh, when we're doing some busting of Young Earth creationism, as you can see, those bad boys get up to two hours, two, three hours, because I just can't, I got to get it all out, you know, I've just, I, <laughs> I, I got to get every single individual point that I want to make out. So, you know, they, those ones take a bit longer. It's like, um, it's, what do they call it? It's like, bur Bernoulli's rule or something where it's like the time that it takes to say something wrong versus the time that it takes to debunk something that's wrong. It's like an order of magnitude different. So yes, crazy, but thank you again for having me. This was an absolute pleasure and very fun. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, folks. Uh, tomorrow is Dr. Michael Shermer. Hopefully you enjoy today's conversation about evolution. It's not just a theory, uh, <laughs> uh, as has as, as been established by Erica. Uh, and I would like to wish you all um, a good weekend and uh, see you tomorrow.